deep trouble at midfield. They tried to do a couple of... The ball is still loose as they get it to Rogers. They give it back now to the 30. They're down to the 20. All the band is out on the field. He's going to go into the end zone. He's going into the end zone. I get asked all the time why I watch sports. And to tell you the truth, the thrill of competition comes down to two very simple things. The euphoria of victory and the agony of defeat. A wise man once said, You play to win the game. A quotation so blunt that many may find it humorous. But if you look past the literal denotation of the statement, it serves more to punctuate the harsh reality of what it truly means to compete. When you get right down to it, sports are brutal. After you strip away all the fame and fortune of being a professional athlete, history only cares about two things. How much you won and how much you lost. As sports fans, we often like to craft little narratives around players and teams, feel-good stories to make them seem a bit more like a protagonist. In this day and age, everyone's looking for a hero. And unfortunately, this is the point where sports deviates from fiction. Because at the end of the day, when all the chips are down, it doesn't matter how much you tried, how far you came, or how well you treated everyone else. All will be forgotten if you fail to win. And unfortunately for our heroes, there's just not a lot of winning to go around. The vast majority of competitors are doomed to retire as nothing more than forgotten losers. But not every loser is necessarily forgettable. As it turns out, there are many ways to lose in sports, some more spectacular than others. You can throw a game on purpose, get cheated out of a win by the refs, or get blown out so badly that it makes everyone question what game you were even playing. However, if you truly want to be remembered in defeat, look no further than the most painful way to lose in all of sports, the choke. 19-yard field goal attempt. Oh, it is stumbled by Romo, and then Romo's gonna run to the end zone, and he's gonna get tackled by Jordan Babino. Oh, the ball just slipped out of his hand. Yep. It was a good snap. And he went to put it down and it just slipped. Your whole season comes down to that. I don't know that I've ever felt this low, you know, at any point. So, I don't know. In 1990, the International Atomic Energy Agency introduced a tiered scale for the purpose of categorizing the severity of nuclear meltdowns. For the purpose of this video, I believe that a similar scale is apropos for chronicling the worst meltdowns in sports. Watching these moments unfold is truly a surreal experience. There's something about it that's so morbid yet compelling, like witnessing a train wreck in slow motion. To have victory within your grasp just to let it slip away, it evokes strange feelings of existential dread. But alas, not all chokes are created equal. Some are much more dreadful than others. Let's start off with the least dreadful. The fundamental building block of every choke is the common blooper. Professional athletes are among the best of the best in strength, speed, and skill, but they're still susceptible to the occasional malfunction. If you play for long enough, you will eventually be served your fair share of humble pie. While the average blooper is often forgotten, a few managed to stand the test of time for their sheer absurdity. Jose Canseco was a baseball player who wasn't exactly known for using his head. That was until a 1993 game when a lucky bounce off the cranium helped to score what may have been the only dome run in the history of the majors. It's unclear whether this moment was more embarrassing than what happened to Larry Walker, who forgot how to count to three in the middle of a 1994 game. And Walker doesn't he so thought that was the third out. Even more perplexing are some of the bloopers found in America's most popular sport, the NFL, whose most infamous gaffes have approached Looney Tunes levels of contrivance. In 2012, a game between the New York Jets and the New England Patriots produced what may be the most notorious folly in recent memory, the butt fumble, a play so humiliating that the Jets franchise has still never quite recovered. It's pretty much the blooper to end all bloopers, and has since overshadowed several other strong contenders for the dumbest of all time. 
In 1964, Minnesota Vikings defender Jim Marshall scooped up a fumble and ran 75 yards for the score. The only problem was that he scored for the other team. Marshall had just carried the ball in the wrong direction. In 2008, Detroit Lions quarterback Dan Orlovsky would show a similar lack of awareness by obliviously trotting out of the back of the end zone. That 08 Lions roster would end up becoming the first team to finish a season 0-16. The polar opposites of the 1972 Miami Dolphins, who finished a perfect 17-0. Strangely enough, this all-time great season culminated in what may very well be the ugliest blooper in the history of American football. With two minutes to go in the Super Bowl, kicker Garo Yapremian was sent out to ice the game with a long field goal. In what looked to be a moment of serendipity, the Dolphins had a chance to end their 17-0 season with a 17-0 victory. However, Yepremian was about to show that the 72 Dolphins were not all perfect. Yepremian has it, throws a pass up for the ball. What a kooky play this way. Gary Yepremian lost his head and tried to throw a pass. It went in the hands of Mike Bass. He scores. Despite the pitiful comedy of errors on that play, the Dolphins hung on to complete what is thus far the only undefeated season in the Super Bowl era, and Garrow's ridiculous folly would be forgiven and forgotten. It just goes to show, winning is all it takes to bail you out of a truly hideous situation. Most of the other stories on this list wish that they could have been as fortunate. On their own, bloopers, errors, and mistakes are mostly inconsequential. Sports are largely governed by averages, and one bad play is typically not enough to sway the outcome of a game or a season. The same can't be said about this next kind of goof, the premature celebration. No! It's easy to clown athletes for a shameful moment, but there are also times when pride is just as dangerous. Everyone knows the story of the tortoise and the hare, but this age-old tale always manages to slip the mind of a few athletes per year. Throughout the history of sports, there are numerous examples of players losing through nothing else but their own hubris. As shown in the fable, racing often serves as the backdrop for many improbable defeats. In 2015, track and field athlete Tanjoy Pepiod was too focused on gesturing to the crowd to notice his competitors stealing the victory from under his nose. In 2004, a similar fate befell superbike racer Sean Emmett. Perhaps the most painful homestretch fail would happen to Olympic snowboarder Lindsay Jacob Ellis, who would kiss the gold medal goodbye after a showboating stunt sent her tumbling into the snow. Moments like these prove the time-honored wisdom that you should never celebrate until after you cross the finish line, or in the case of American football, the end zone. It's a sport which has seen an alarming number of cases where a celebrating player has inexplicably dropped the ball at the one-yard line, thus invalidating what should have been a guaranteed score. One such case that's particularly hard to watch happened in a 2014 college game between Utah and Oregon. After the Utah receiver let go of a surefire touchdown, Oregon returned it 99 yards the other way. A 14-point swing, all from one careless mistake. It's a mistake so punishing you'd think that any player would learn to never do it again. Well, any player besides Deshaun Jackson, who dropped the ball not once, but twice in his career. Perhaps the most famous case of dropping the ball came on the biggest stage. In Super Bowl 27, Leon Lett's hot-dogging allowed an opposing player to catch up and strip the ball before he scored. Nine months later, with the Super Bowl blunders still fresh in everyone's mind, Leon would somehow manage to top it. In a Thanksgiving Day game against the Dolphins, a blocked field goal at the end of regulation left the whole Cowboys sideline celebrating. Unfortunately, another inexplicable botch would render that celebration premature. Wait a minute, wait a minute! Now someone touches the football here. It's Leon Lett. No! The Dolphins pull it out. 16-14. Game over. It's safe to say that after this, 
both Leon and the Cowboys were reminded of the most fundamental law in competition. It ain't over till it's over. Sports can be truly chaotic, and there is very little that can be confidently excluded from the possible range of outcomes. As someone who spends a lot of time watching a losing team, I often find myself imagining a hypothetical list of events that would have to occur for them to actually win. The more they're getting beat, the more preposterous that list becomes. But would that imaginary comeback be impossible or just improbable? In other words, at what point does a deficit become truly insurmountable? We may never know for sure how big of a lead is safe, but we do know which ones are not. On April 21st, 2012, the Boston Red Sox got out to a 9-0 lead against their arch rivals, the New York Yankees. Just three innings later, the Yankees had scored 15 straight runs, flipping the script on what surely looked like a Boston blowout. It was one of the biggest swings in any baseball game ever, and it fell just short of the biggest outright comeback. Three times in MLB history has a team blown a 12-run lead, the most recent being the 2001 Seattle Mariners, who allowed the Cleveland Indians to crawl all the way back from a 14-2 deficit. The largest blown lead in basketball history belongs to the 1996 Denver Nuggets, who were unable to close out a 36-point cushion. In 1957, Huddersfield Town would blow the biggest single-game lead of any football club. After building a towering 5-1 margin with just 27 minutes to play, the Terriers would somehow go on to blow a four-goal lead, losing 6-7. In ice hockey, numerous NHL teams have managed to blow a five-goal lead, including Wayne Gretzky's Edmonton Oilers, who couldn't hang on to a 5-0 lead in a 1982 playoff game. Coincidentally, the biggest comeback in NFL history would also befall the Oilers in a playoff game who squandered an almost unthinkable 35-3 lead to the Buffalo Bills. Statistically speaking, these games are all candidates for the worst ever choke of their respective sports. But considering the full context in which they occurred, few are remembered as such. Most of these losses just didn't end up mattering in the grand scheme of things, relegating them to probabilistic anomalies, mere trivia for a number of obsessed geeks. They don't really come to mind when the average sports fan thinks of the most gut-wrenching chokes. As the INES would say, they were disasters with only local consequences. If we want to find some truly epic chokes, we're going to need some bigger fish to fry. It's fairly agreed upon in sports jargon that the term choke describes when a team or player has exhausted a massive advantage. In most circumstances, it refers to an advantage that has been built up over the course of a game. However, in a few cases, that advantage is in play long before the game even starts. In every sports league, you're bound to run into mismatches, where one competitor is heavily favored over the other. While nobody wants to blow a huge lead, it can sometimes prove just as humiliating to lose to an opponent you're expected to dominate. Heading into 1990, Mike Tyson was far and away the most feared fighter on the planet. Boasting an undefeated 37-0 record with 33 knockouts, the heavyweight champion was probably the closest any fighter has ever been to being truly invincible. Fans were anticipating him to make quick work of 42-1 longshot Buster Douglas. But to everyone's shock, the mostly unknown underdog would hand Iron Mike the first loss of his career in what is widely considered to be the biggest upset in boxing history. Not bad for a guy who had pretty much been brought in as a jobber. It turns out that a few other sports make use of jobbers, most notably college football, whose top teams are notorious for scheduling a few games a year versus cupcake opponents. University athletic departments have been known to pay six-figure sums for vastly inferior teams to come into town and get pummeled into the turf. It's a small price to pay for what should be an automatic victory. That's certainly what the 2007 Michigan Wolverines were thinking when they scheduled their opening day contest against the Appalachian State Mountaineers. Going into the season, Michigan was ranked as the fifth best team in the nation, and their opponents were quite literally out of their league. The Mountaineers were a Division I AA team, a complete tier beneath Michigan's pedigree. 
There would have been no shame if Appalachian State had simply laid down and accepted their beating. Unfortunately for Michigan, they were about to learn that there are no free wins in sports. And the kick is blocked! Appalachian State has stunned the college football world! One of the greatest upsets in sports history! College sports provide ample opportunities for the classic Cinderella story, a term most frequently used during March Madness. In Division I basketball, the season champion is decided by a 64-team single elimination tournament. The early rounds of the tournament are a breeding ground for memorable upsets, as the top teams in the country face off against others who are just happy to be there. Every few years or so, a powerhouse team would get bounced from the tournament by some school you couldn't even find on a map. But after 33 years of the 64-team format, a one seed had never been defeated by a 16 seed. That was until 2018, when the 31-2 Virginia Cavaliers faced off against the UMBC Retrievers. In what may very well have been the most shocking upset in the history of college sports, Virginia didn't just lose, but got blown out by 20 points. College sports aren't for everyone, but you have to admit that they are capable of producing madness that you won't see anywhere else. However, the most enduring upsets are left to the professionals. The 2007 New England Patriots are considered by some to be the greatest NFL team ever assembled. They set all kinds of records and were on track for a perfect season to surpass the 72 Dolphins. After cruising to the Super Bowl, they faced off against the paltry New York Giants, a team that hadn't even won their division. After leading for most of the game, the Patriots were just two minutes away from capping off the greatest season in NFL history. But hey, those pesky Giants somehow, someway, could not be stopped. And the mighty Patriots had to settle for 18-1. Every year, the Super Bowl is the most watched broadcast in America, but its viewership pales in comparison to the World Cup, which consistently attracts an audience of billions. The largest in-person audience for any World Cup game was estimated to be 220,000 for the 1950 final in Rio de Janeiro, an audience that would go on to witness one of the most brutal defeats in the history of sports. That year, the Brazilian men's national team looked unstoppable, they had smoked their past two opponents by a combined score of 13 to 2, and had only Uruguay standing in the way of their first World Cup. The Brazilians were so confident in their victory that they had politicians delivering congratulatory speeches before the game even started. Due to the unusual round-robin format of that year's tournament, Brazil could draw the game and still win the cup. It seemed simple enough. You have all the momentum in the world, you are far and away the better team. All you have to do is not lose in your home stadium, and you're the world champions. They lost. 2-1. to one. There's an argument to be made that out of every defeat in the history of sports, this was the single most agonizing. After the game, the 200,000 Brazilians in attendance sat in absolute silence. They weren't just stunned, they were traumatized. It was reported that in the following moments, multiple fans leapt from the grandstands to their deaths. This may be hard to understand for non-sports viewers, but some people just really do care that much about the outcome of a game. As absurd as it may be to say, choking can literally be a matter of life and death. The biggest upsets certainly live up to their name. They can be quite upsetting to watch. However, these moments don't place as highly on the scale of sorrow when you consider why they were called upsets in the first place. While the Davids of the sports world may eke out the occasional fluke win, there's a reason why the Goliaths have earned their title. Apart from the rare stumble, they tend to win. A lot. After losing to UMBC, Virginia would run it back and win the tournament the very next season. Mike Tyson would eventually reclaim his heavyweight title. The Patriots won three more Super Bowls and Brazil won five World Cups. It's safe to say that most of these guys ended up just fine. When we come back, we'll take a look at chokes so devastating that no one involved would ever really recover. Do you realize what could have happened if I hadn't sensed the pit in time? I suppose you 
could have choked? Well, everyone, it's the worst time of the year, football season. Boy, I can't wait to watch the Jaguars suck it up for another four and a half months. But thankfully, rooting for a putrid team can suck just a little bit less with today's sponsor, Bespoke Post. A subscription service that ships out premium goods every month, or about twice as often as every Jaguars win. Bespoke offers a variety of products ranging from outdoor, home, cooking, and more. Just take the online quiz to find one that's right for you. By subscribing, Bespoke will send you a box with $70 worth of stuff for just a fraction of the cost, which makes them a far better value than Jaguars tickets. Each month, you get a preview of what's inside, and unlike your abysmal hometown franchise, if you don't like the product, you can swap it out for something else or skip the month entirely for no charge. For football fans, I recommend Bespoke's parked camping chair for your tailgating needs. And for Jaguars fans specifically, I recommend one of Bespoke's many alcohol-related accessories, because God knows you're gonna need it. And who could forget the classic Weekender travel bag? Perfect for those days when you really need to cover up your shame. So get in the game. Visit bespokepost.com slash emplemon20 and use code emplemon20 at checkout for 20% off your first box. I'm sure that just like Urban Meyer, you'll get a kick out of it. But hey, it's not all doom and gloom in Jacksonville. In fact, the Jags may have actually figured out the NFL's greatest new strategy. You can't choke if you're never winning in the first place. Many children around the world have dreams of becoming a star athlete. It's an all too common thought to envision yourself scoring the game winning shot as the clock expires. What many of us fail to consider, however, is the opposite case. A handful of athletes do manage to beat the odds and make it to the biggest stage. But rather than having their dreams come true, they all of a sudden find themselves in the midst of a living nightmare. Chris Webber had a solid NBA career but most people only remember him for one costly mistake that he made in college. They have no timeouts remaining. Oh, he causes he too called. many timeouts. That's a technical foul. He called a timeout. Michigan doesn't yes. have any. Down by two in the final seconds of the championship game, Weber got caught in a bind and attempted to reset the situation by calling timeout. The only problem was that his team was out of timeouts, resulting in a technical foul that immediately ended their chances of victory. It seemed that no matter how much Chris Webber accomplished in the rest of his basketball career, he could never overcome the stigma of this one miscue. A similar fate would befall NFL tight end Jackie Smith. In the 1970s, he was one of the best players at his position. During the 78 season, he was called out of retirement to play for a Dallas Cowboys team with championship aspirations. That team did end up making it to the Super Bowl, and down by a score late, quarterback Roger Staubach targeted a wide-open Smith in the end zone, who proceeded to drop the game-tying touchdown. Oh, bless his heart, he's got to be the sickest man in America. Dallas was forced to settle for a field goal, and that four-point swing wound up being the difference in the game. Smith's pivotal blunder caused him to be single-handedly blamed for the defeat. Today, this lone moment is pretty much all he's known for. Across his Hall of Fame career, Jackie Smith caught 480 passes, but he is forever doomed to be remembered for the one he dropped. It can seem rather unjust how much one mistake can ruin someone's legacy. In the 1994 World Cup, Roberto Baggio was the breakout star of the whole tournament, helping to carry the Italians to the finals. But after the game went to penalties when the team needed him most, he sailed his lone opportunity over the crossbar. The miss would haunt Baggio for years, who is remembered today as one of the best players to never win the World Cup. In association football, the striker is often the most revered position on the field. The same can't be said for their American counterparts. In the NFL, the kicker is one of the most thankless roles that anyone can fill. We're talking about our idiot kicker. 
Do your job well and no one bats an eye, but screw up just once and you will be ridiculed until the cows come home. In recent history, two of the cruelest misses that come to mind are Blair Walsh's chip shot shank and Cody Parkey's double doink. However, the distinction for the costliest miss in NFL history has to go to one of two incidents from the 90s. Across more than a half century, four Super Bowls have been decided by a last second field goal. Three were made and one was missed. The dishonor belonged to Buffalo Bills kicker Scott Norwood, who missed wide right on a 47 yarder that would have won the Bills the title. It's a moment that has tragically become the most replayed missed field goal of all time. However, in defense of Norwood, the standard for kickers back then was much less efficient than what we see today. 47 yards was about at the limit of his range, so the attempt was certainly no gimme, especially considering the circumstances. For my money, the NFL's actual worst miss occurred eight years later, in the 1998 NFC Championship game. Minnesota Vikings kicker Gary Anderson had not missed a kick all season, leading by a touchdown with two minutes left. All Anderson had to do was make one more to put the game out of reach. However, when staring down the most crucial kick of his life, Anderson could not deliver. And all of a sudden, his perfect season had turned into the perfect storm. It was just a matter of time before the Vikings lead was gone, along with their championship hopes. It can often be difficult for sports fans to reconcile the complex list of reasons for why their team lost. It's usually far easier to pin the whole mess on one player and one moment, no matter how unreasonable it may be. This type of coping mechanism is otherwise known as scapegoating, and in the history of sports, there was perhaps no bigger scapegoat than Bill Buckner. Uh, the nightmares are that you're going to let the winning run uh, score on a ground ball through your legs. Late in Game 6 of the 1986 World Series, Boston Red Sox manager John McNamara made the fateful decision to leave Buckner in the game at first base. By this point, the 18-year veteran was well past his prime and would usually be subbed out for a more sure-handed defender in crucial situations. However, as the elder statesman of the team, Buckner was given the honors to close out what was anticipated to be a very special moment. Leading the New York Mets 5-3 in the bottom of the 10th, the Red Sox were just three outs away from winning their first championship in nearly 70 years. After retiring the first two batters, relief pitcher Calvin Schiraldi got into a jam, and the Mets would tie the game off a wild pitch with the bases loaded. The next batter, Mookie Wilson, appeared to end the inning by hitting a ground ball directly at Bill Buckner. It's the most routine defensive play in all of baseball, one so elementary that most children have no problem making it. Bill Buckner had probably done so a thousand times by that point in his career. But on this day, his glove is a bit loose, his ankles are a tad weak, and he's not quite the player he used to be. Behind the man! The Red Sox would go on to lose Game 7, and the fury of a tortured fan base would be placed squarely on Bill Buckner's shoulders. The error had made him a national laughingstock, and an absolute outcast in the city of Boston. Buckner had to endure so much hatred that he eventually had to move his family out to Idaho, where no one knew who he was. And with that, we've reached a point where chokes stop being so entertaining and start being pretty hard to watch. To go back and revisit this footage over and over again, we are prying into what is quite literally the worst day of someone's life. A moment in which their destiny was profoundly and permanently altered for the worse. But what if that moment were dragged out just a little bit longer? For as bad as some of these disasters are, at the very least they come and go in an instant. The victims aren't given any time to marinate in their active suffering. Even more terrifying than a single nightmare moment is the meltdown, where an athlete's anguish is sustained over a much longer time frame. This is no longer your average everyday choking. This is 
advanced choking. Golf could be described as one of the loneliest sports of all. If you screw up, you have no one to blame but yourself. This psychological spell has set the stage for some of the most epic implosions that any competitor has ever experienced. In the 1999 British Open, Jean Vandeveld is playing the tournament of his life. He entered the weekend ranked outside the top 100 players on tour, and is now on the cusp of winning one of the sport's crown jewel events. All he has to do is complete the final hole in six strokes. The following 14 minutes can only be described as a real-life horror movie. Well, do you do? I don't believe this. I don't believe it. Oh dear, this is so, 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 so sad. Uh, what are you doing? Oh, Jean, please, would somebody kindly let's go and stop it? Now, I don't know. We've, many of us have tried these kind of shots, but he's going to sink deeper and deeper. I've never seen anything like it before, and to attempt to hit the ball out of there is pure madness. Well, he's thinking about it, but this is horrendous stuff, Alex. No, thank, thank goodness, good sense for that. Oh, yes. I just don't understand what on earth he was thinking about. Vandeveld would eventually finish the 18th hole with a triple bogey 7 and would go on to lose in a playoff. For the rest of his career, he would never even sniff another major tournament win. Golf may be considered the sport of gentlemen, but there are times when it can be absolutely savage. Three years before Jean Vandeveld's meltdown, Greg Norman succumbed to one that was even worse. If you thought one hole of misery was bad, you should see it prolonged over an entire round. Norman entered the final day of the 1996 Masters with a commanding six-stroke lead. Over the course of that Sunday afternoon, that lead would slowly and steadily evaporate into nothingness. It was like watching a wayward sailor adrift at sea in a sinking ship. There was no saving him. In about three hours, Norman's six-stroke lead had disintegrated into a five-stroke deficit. By the end of it all, he wasn't even close to winning. One bad play can be written off as an outlier. Several in a row can be chalked up to some bad luck. But to suddenly lose your God-given abilities for an entire game, you just might have to start believing in curses. One fan base very familiar with curses is that of the Chicago Cubs, who by 2003 had experienced nearly a century of futility. In that season's NLCS, they finally looked on track to reverse their fortunes. After shutting out the Florida Marlins for the first seven innings of Game 6, the Cubs were just five outs away from a long-awaited return to the World Series. But after Cubs fan Steve Bartman crossed paths with a chance foul ball, it was as if fate itself had flipped a switch. The Cubs, who had controlled the entire game to that point, had just been transported to the inning from hell. Into left field, a base hit by Rodriguez. Pierre scores to make it a 3-1 ball game. Round ball in the hole is short. And bobbled by Gonzalez and everybody's safe. Hammered down the left field line, and the game will be tied up. In the air right field. The throw will come to the plate, and the Marlins have taken a 4-3 lead. That ball hammered into left center field. Three runs are going to score on a double by Mordecai. And this crowd at Wrigley Field stunned in disbelief. Baseball is one of the only sports with no time limit, meaning that the potential for suffering is theoretically infinite. After watching their victory disappear before their eyes, Cubs fans must have been wondering if the torment would ever end. It turned out that the old curse was there to stay for just a bit longer. At the turn of the 21st century, the only other baseball team as misfortunate as the Cubs were our old friends, the Red Sox. Not only did they have a generational championship drought of their own, they had to sit and watch as their bitter rivals became the most successful franchise in all of sports. 
Throughout the 20th century, the Red Sox had almost too many heartbreaks to count, with one of the absolute worst taking place in the 1978 season. On the morning of July 20th, the Red Sox led the American League standings by a staggering 14-game margin over the Yankees. By September, Boston's lead had dwindled to just four games, just as they were slated to face the Yankees in a four-game series. The Red Sox ended up getting swept so badly that the performance went on to be known as the Boston Massacre. Just like that, the 14-game lead had vanished, and the Yankees had tied them in the standings. After squandering the entire advantage they once had, the Red Sox were given one last opportunity to right the ship, a regular season tiebreaker in their home stadium, with the winner advancing to the postseason. However, any chance of redemption would soon be foiled when Bucky Dent, a player who had only hit four home runs that entire season, blasted a three-run shot that ended up winning the game for the Yankees. Boston was once again left in the dust, and would have to watch their nemesis win yet another championship. Late season collapses are probably the most long-form meltdowns in all of sports, but in a season as long as baseball's, they're not unprecedented. If you want to know the absolute nastiest chokes that sports have to offer, you will find them in an exclusive collection of moments that were truly one of a kind. When it comes to ripping your heart out, these are the cream of the crop. At long last, we have arrived at the Chernobyl of sports disasters, a handful of events that no matter how many times you watch, still seem inconceivable. We've talked about missed field goals before, but there's one particular miss that I've neglected to discuss until now. In the NFL, desperation plays are rarely ever successful. But in a 2003 game between the Saints and Jaguars, New Orleans scored one of the only multilateral touchdowns of the 21st century. Now, the uninitiated out there may think that we have finally uncovered the elusive Jacksonville Jaguars choke. But rest assured, the real choke was yet to come. And he missed no! He missed the extra point wide right! After one of the most sensational plays in recent memory, Saints kicker John Carney missed the extra point, a kick which at the time had almost a 99% success rate. The River City Relay would ultimately be in vain, and like most things in Jacksonville, would be pretty much forgotten. Believe it or not though, there are still more painful ways to lose a football game. To find out how, we have to once again visit our favorite college chokers, the Michigan Wolverines whose football program never really recovered from the loss to Appalachian State. In 2015, Michigan looked to turn things around by hiring former NFL head coach Jim Harbaugh. Suffice to say, his tenure thus far hasn't quite lived up to expectations. We could have seen it coming had we paid attention to a particular omen from his first season in charge. With just 10 seconds left, the Wolverines have a two-point lead against rival Michigan State. All they have to do to win is run one successful punt. Well, he has trouble with the snap, and the ball is free! It's picked up by Michigan State, and he scores on the last play of the game! And well, I think this guy's expression says it all. But for as frustrating as this was to watch, there is still one loss in the history of American football that is even more inexcusable. On November 19, 1978, the New York Giants are leading the Philadelphia Eagles 17-12 with just 30 seconds to play. The Giants have the ball, and the Eagles have no timeouts. Theoretically, losing from this position should be impossible, but for some godforsaken reason, the Giants are going to find a way to do so. Funnily enough, their demise would come almost entirely from the NFL's weird problem with kneeling and not the kind you're probably thinking of. In the modern day game, it is customary for teams to close out their final possession in victory formation, where the quarterback simply touches his knee to the ground and runs out the rest of the clock. But back in the day, many people in the league took issue to intentionally downing the ball, going so far as to call it unsportsmanlike. 
Because of this, the foolproof strategy was sometimes disregarded in favor of a more conventional play. All quarterback Joe Pizzerchik had to do was drop to the ground and the Giants were home free. However, offensive coordinator Bob Gibson insisted on running a handoff. When the play call came in, the Giants players were in disbelief, with running back Larry Zonka outright refusing to take the ball. But after Gibson threatened to cut Pizzerchik if he disobeyed the order, the play went on as planned. And well, there's a reason why every team today just takes a knee. Wait a minute, here's a free foot, I don't believe it! The Eagles pick it up and Herman Edwards runs it in for a touchdown! The Eagles scored the game-winning touchdown from a fumble that shouldn't even have been a possibility. Giants fans were so irate that many ended up throwing the next game's tickets into a bonfire. Bob Gibson was axed the next morning and was never hired to coach at any level of football ever again. Perhaps the most fitting thing of all was the player who scored that touchdown. Most of you watching may not recognize him, but if you've been following along, this is someone we've already met long ago, and his wisdom rang just as true all the way back then. Players and coaches that get labeled as chokers don't tend to stick around for very long, but ever so often you'll find one that does, an exceptional talent who can just never have things work out for them in the end. This type of competitor is otherwise known as a choke artist, the most notable of which has to be NBA point guard Chris Paul. In 14 playoff appearances, Paul has managed to blow a 3-2 lead, a 3-1 lead, and a jaw-dropping 5-2-0 leads. No matter which team he plays for, postseason success is always just out of reach. One of those teams was the 2018 Houston Rockets, who finished the regular season at the top of the Western Conference standings, ahead of the formidable Golden State Warriors. The Warriors had taken the league by storm after becoming extremely efficient at shooting three-pointers. Rockets general manager Daryl Morey could see the tide turning and constructed a roster designed to beat the Warriors at their own game. The two teams were on a collision course that would ultimately be decided in Game 7 of the conference finals. Leading by 12 in the second quarter, the Rockets would enter the most unholy stretch of basketball that any team has ever witnessed. In the next 23 minutes of game time, the Rockets missed 27 threes in a row. That year, the Rockets were having the most productive three-point shooting season in history. They had made over 36% of their attempts. The odds of this team missing 27 in a row was about 1 in 186,000. And for it to happen at the absolute worst possible time, that's a level of cruelty I cannot even begin to describe. It's one thing to cost yourself the game off some incompetent mistake, but at least in that case you get to blame it on something. What's truly demoralizing is being defeated by nothing more than the cold indifference of chance. If you think that 1 in 186,000 are rough odds, they don't even come close to the level of misfortune that Toronto Blue Jays pitcher Dave Steve experienced in September of 1988. One of the greatest achievements for any pitcher is the no-hitter. In the 150-year history of the majors, only 317 have ever been thrown. At the end of the 88 season, Dave Steve had two consecutive no-hitters blown up on the last possible out. Sports writer John Boyes estimated that the chance of this happening was 1 in 241 million. But that still may not be as unlikely as what happened in the world of motorsports on May 29, 2011. Many consider the last Sunday in May to be the greatest day in racing. In the United States, it features two long-standing traditions, starting at noon with the Indy 500, whose 2011 running saw rookie J.R. Hildebrand one lap away from victory. In the final corner, he misjudged a pass on a lapped car and crashed allowing second place Dan Weldon to steal the win on the final straightaway. The sponsor of Hildebrand's car was the National Guard, who just so happened to be sponsoring Dale Earnhardt Jr.'s car in the Coke 600 that evening. As Earnhardt found himself leading on the final lap, the National Guard car would experience deja vu. Junior is slowing! He's out of fuel! He's out of, out of gas! And as at Indy, the leader at turn four does not get to the flag. In an astounding coincidence, 
Two separate drivers with the same sponsor would lose their respective races in the final turn of the final lap. A remarkable case of synchronized choking. Can choking really manifest itself on a macroscopic level? If so, the best evidence of it happening would have to be the wildest time in the history of American sports, 2016, otherwise known as the year of the choke. It started in the NBA Western Conference Finals, where the Oklahoma City Thunder blew a 3-1 series lead to the Golden State Warriors. After advancing to the finals, the Warriors proceeded to blow a 3-1 lead against the Cleveland Cavaliers. Five months later in the World Series, the Cleveland Indians blew a 3-1 lead to the Chicago Cubs, who finally ended their century-long championship drought. Two championship collapses in the same sports season was almost unprecedented, but the worst was still yet to come. Three months after the World Series, the Atlanta Falcons orchestrated the worst choke in Super Bowl history, blowing a 28-3 lead to the New England Patriots. In a span of just eight months, all three major American sports saw their champions crowned through the ashes of historic chokes, a feat that will probably never happen again. Of course, I would be remiss if I didn't mention a certain other choke that happened in the United States at around the same time, in what has very much become our country's new most popular sport. But out of the prior three, the Falcons choke has to be the most iconic. However, I personally consider the Warriors choke to be the most historically fascinating. That season, the Warriors broke a record that few thought was possible. Their 73 regular season wins were the most in NBA history, and we would probably look back on them as the greatest team ever if they hadn't choked in the finals. Their defeat completed one of the strangest statistical oddities in all of sports. Combined with the 96 Red Wings, the 01 Mariners, and the 07 Patriots, the best regular season team from each of the big four U.S. sports leagues has failed to win the championship. The Warriors have had no shortage of winning since, but that missing ring still looms as a big blemish on an otherwise dominant dynasty. In sports, blowing a 3-1 lead is pretty uncommon. Blowing an 8-1 lead sounds almost unfathomable. The Competitive Yacht Racing Championship features a best of 17 series, and in the 2013 running, Team New Zealand led Team USA 8 races to 1. Needing only a single victory in the next eight to clinch the title, New Zealand would go on to lose each and every one. In terms of sheer magnitude, no other choke in sports even comes close. But if you're asking me about the absolute greatest choke of all time, there is one other that tops it. While an 8-1 choke is truly mind-blowing, I still prefer the simple elegance of the 3-0 choke, the fabled reverse sweep. Everyone knows baseball as one of those sports that's so old, pretty much any feat you can imagine has already been done long ago. But as of the 2004 season, no team had ever come back from a three games to none series deficit. 2004 marked year 86 of misery for the Boston Red Sox, who look to once again have their hopes and dreams shattered by the New York Yankees. There had been Red Sox fans who lived and died without ever once seeing their beloved team win at all. All they had ever known was non-stop heartbreak, countless opportunities utterly wasted. By this point, the outcome seemed like a foregone conclusion. The Red Sox are getting crushed, again. Their last sliver of hope relies on doing something that had never been done before in the history of their sport. It all comes down to this the Boston Red Sox versus the rest of time. You know, thus far I've only really shown chokes in a negative light. I've described them as brutal, cruel, and agonizing. But very rarely you'll encounter those ethereal moments when a choke is actually quite beautiful, where all the broken pieces just manage to fit together in the most perfect way. It's like poetry in motion, a surreal window into someplace else, where great things really can happen. The truth is that outside of the sports world, most of us are losers. It can seem like whatever success we do find always manages to slip away. In a society that seems to value winning above all else, it's a tough pill to swallow. 
losing is as undesirable as it is universal. It's hard to find a feeling more relatable. No matter how good you are, everyone has to lose eventually. In sports, it's easy to get caught up in the ruthless pursuit of glory. At times, it can feel downright nihilistic. Perhaps the reason we find chokes so compelling is that they're the closest winners and losers ever get to each other. They remind us that not even the greatest winners can outrun the inevitability of defeat. It's the reason we watch and the reason we play. If the woeful Red Sox could come back against the mighty Yankees, who knows what else is possible. Back to full. Red Sox fans have longed to hear it. The Boston Red Sox are world champions. The Yankees, who are the storied franchise, as we all know, are now at a dark hour because they just took the worst defeat, not only in my lifetime as a Yankee fan, I think, without question, the worst defeat in their history. Now, whenever you see a team go down 3-0 in any sport, they will put up a graphic on television which will say, 2004, Red Sox down 3-0, beat New York Yankees. This is now part of sports history, and every guy who's got a team down with its back to the walls is going to talk about the Red Sox for the next 30 years.